during the the year of during the year of George Floyd's killing and the subsequent protests and riots, there was a huge push to get uh, to divert to, to diversify boards in, in order, in other words, to get black millionaires on the seats on the boards of publicly traded companies so they could become wealthier. And this was justified as a direct response to the death of a black dude from the hood who died under the knee of a police officer from a totally different reality uh, as the great majority of, of the black millionaires that are now, you know, being thrust on, on board seats as if that action rectifies or has almost anything to do with the problems and the trials and tribulations of someone like George Floyd and people who grow up in those communities, right? Yeah. And this was never called like greed or avarice. It was it was presented as justice, as this is somehow social justice, not... So like to me, this was a, an example of your point that this notion of racial solidarity or racial oneness or identity politics can really obscure... Um, massive inequalities that we we remedy in these cheap ways that actually do very little for for people that are truly disadvantaged. Yeah, so I would tweak that just a little bit by saying I want to be really clear about the fact of identity politics, which all politics is identity politics. Whether you're saying your identity is as a West Virginia Virginian or a, or a New Jerseyan Um, And you have politics that are related to the state that you're from, whether the fact of your being a man or a woman, you know, gay or straight, trans, what have you, affects your politics or what you fight for, whether you're rich or poor, your class identity is part of your identity, whether you're an immigrant or native born is part of your identity, whether you're tall or short. I mean, every single thing about who you are as a human being is a kind of identity politics and Republican or Democrat, you know. From the history of politics, there have always been identities, religious identities, et cetera, that have informed one's perspective and has pushed people into kind of groups one way or another. My concern is the extent to which identity, oftentimes in the context I'm describing, racial identity is being weaponized. So my critique is not of identity politics as a phenomenon. It's just a phenomenon. It's a a neutral reality. And I I want to be clear about this because sometimes people say identity politics is a problem because they don't want people to be advocating for shared interests by identity members, right? So obviously if if you live in a building, let's say, with a um, exploitative landlord who is not giving you hot water and you rally together with all the other residents of 52 Huffington Street to get your rights, if I come along and say it's illegitimate for you guys to band together because the identity of 52 Huffington Street Streetians is is identity politics and wrong. That's obviously silly, right? The whole point is that you have a shared fight that you're fighting for together. And that can be true of racial groups or people who live in a state or a community and all other kinds of things. And there's nothing wrong with advocating on the basis of your shared marginalization. The problem is, especially when it comes to race in this country, oftentimes and what people are saying they're fighting for a shared identity group, but to your example, they're actually sharing for a very narrow band, fighting for a very narrow band of class interest. So there is this presumption that all black people share the same class interest and therefore the interest of one black person is necessarily the interest of another. And that enables folks to weaponize, to weaponize the idea of identity politics against the interest of the majority of the group that they are purporting to fight for. And that's what's so pernicious about it. It's the weaponized identity politics where they can say, we're going to get more black people on corporate boards as a means to address the miscarriage of justice that was George Floyd's Floyd's murder. Or we're going to um, elect Barack Obama, and that's going to be a stand-in for addressing some of the systemic concerns that are experienced disproportionately by black people. And also by so many other people who I think are left out of a coalition because often it is framed exclusively in identity terms. And this is something that our mutual friends at Jelani, I think, is very right to point out, that there is a way that sometimes liberal movements can, you know, cut off, cut off their nose to despite their face. 
because there are people who might be members of their coalition um, who are not included as part of the conversation because it's understood solely, exclusively in racial terms instead of as racial and class terms simultaneously, which is is very easy to do. And and Zed, the particular example I'm thinking of is his analysis that showed that um, some huge percent, like 95%, I forget the exact number, don't don't quote me on that, but of all police shootings happen in neighborhoods Mm -hmm. where the average income is under $100,000 a year. uh, And and zero happen when it's over $200,000 a year. And so we're really talking about a class issue here that's being obscured in addition to there obviously being racial bias as a component of it. So I I think I like the way you... how you framed it helps me understand your point of view that you're not against identity politics as such, but you're against the weaponization of identity right. politics. And I think where I differ from you, I, th- I believe, is that I think racial identity politics in practice almost always gets weaponized because... So, like, to take your example of, of you know, the, the 52nd Street, uh, Huffington Street people. <laughs> yeah. That group is, it's picking out a group of people that are actually all experiencing the same grievance. Mm. So it makes perfect sense for them to organize around it. Their, their landlord is terrorizing all of them, right? Race, like, like there's almost, at this point in American society, there, there's very rarely a grievance that picks out black people as a category cleanly. Right. It's like, uh, uh, you know, the so many of the things that we're actually talking about when we think we're talking about race, like the example you gave, are are pegged much more closely to poverty, um, sometimes even more to intergenerational poverty, um, intergenerational poverty and crime. The problems of what ha- used to be called the underclass or the ghetto. And uh, and so I don't think it's a. um sort of a, a unique exception or a particularly egregious example of the, you know, people pushing to get on boards as if that has something to do with what George Floyd, George Floyd's, what George Floyd went through. I think that is an inevitable consequence of a society where we allow, I don't mean legally, but where we promote culturally yeah. identity politics, because it's just, it creates a never ending incentive for people that are actually quite privileged to claim the skin color connection and, and therefore to organize on those terms. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's an interesting question whether or not organizing around racial identity, it has diminishing returns in a country where the mechanisms to weaponize identity, white racial identity are so efficient and complete, but it is also not exclusively a concern for black people. So I would argue, for example, that historically, in the recent history at least, Republicans have done an amazing job of doing a similar dance with working class whites, where if you were to ask, you know, the, the biggest turnaround of the 20th century was this mobile, this shift from working class white voters identifying with Democrats because of their commitment to labor issues, to both corporate parties basically abandoning labor issues and it becoming this kind of like, who can, who can speak the lingua, lingua franca of labor issues in the same way with black people you have, who can say the right thing, the woke thing on TV without ever trying to commit in any meaningful way. So now you had, once everyone threw labor under the bus, it became the Republicans who did a better job of speaking to the white working class voter than the Democratic voter. And the Democratic voter said, okay, we're going to pivot and do minorities and do this identity politics speak, both of which are very superficial, right? Democrats don't do anything for black people. <laughs> Bill Clinton cuts the social safety net, uh, enacts and play, the crime and bill. Plays saxophone, but he plays and plays the saxophone, saxophone so right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He, he says to soldiers, he opens his campaign at the ac- execution of a, of, of a mentally, um, of a, of a low IQ black prisoner, all of these things to signal that he absolutely isn't going to help black people, but it doesn't matter because what's the alternative? It's a Republican party who's gone all in on saying, well, the rest of the country is mine and, you know, wearing a hard hat and American and flag pin, but also, um, supporting all of these trade policies that sent that both parties did, by the way, we had two corporate parties who were supporting these trade policies to send all these jobs overseas con- contributed to industrial decline, um, all the job loss in the Midwest and all of the fallout, um, that we had to deal with, 
uh, in terms of the deregulatory landscape in 2008, which still, you know, has had this lingering effect, which no one wants to talk about, but, you know, like 30% of the pensions of a huge portion of the population was gone and it was 40% for black Americans, right? So uh, their collective value was gone in 2008, not never to recover. So what we do have is uh, performances across the board. I, I don't disagree with you. And I think it's an interesting question. How much should we credit the utility of identity politics in, a, in, a, in this kind of public sphere when it is being so corrupted? But this is a bigger question than kind of racial identity politics. And that is, I think, what a lot of the left is wrestling with. Not progr- not um, liberals, by the way. I want to be really clear that when I refer to liberals, I'm not referring to anything that I identify with. I, I'm thinking of corporate Democrats, mainstream Democrats who very much trade almost exclusively in this kind of weaponized identity rhetoric. When I talk about the left, I mean a more economic populist part of the country that identified with the Bernie Sanders movement and who has been for a long time very critical about the cynical weaponization of identity, in part because we saw how it was used to elevate Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders in 2016. I think that was a real eye-opening moment for people. But it's also a question that I think conservatives are going to have to start grappling with, and I think they are with some interlocutors like Tucker Carlson, who, whether you think it's in good faith or bad, has been raising some of these class issues and has been willing to talk about things like um, uh, senators being able to do insider trading and mm-hmm. having a critique of that, that you'll, ha- you'll, you're, you're, you'll find it difficult to see on MSNBC, for instance, or you know, talking about NAFTA and some of these trade policies, which Donald Trump talked about and liberals refused to kind of acknowledge had real resonance with people separate and apart from any of the other kind of rhetoric that he was using that was more nativist or, you know, uh, bigoted or whatever, however you want to describe it. And that to me is, is, is a big question. Is there going to be an insurgent left that is able to capture a lot of the populist energy in the country that is well-founded and well-grounded and legitimate because of the way that our institutions, our media institutions and our political institutions have divested themselves from substantive economic policy, politics and is just fighting us back and forth with each other over CRT and don't say gay and you're racist and woke? Or is it going to be the right that manages to put forward a, a populist person who? gets all of that populist energy, but I would argue is not going to funnel it meaningfully in good faith toward economic programs that are actually going to help people. It's going to just continue to um, lead to a winner's take all um, state of rugged individualism where the rich continue to exert the advantage they already have to use the systems that are in place and which are already deeply uh, inequitable to continue to squeeze the working classes as they've been doing for the last, you know, 30, 40 years of neoliberalism. (laughs) 